So I'm actually giving the next presentation. So um, uh, Paul, Paul, can you be can you moderate on this one? Yes, George, start talking, please. All right, thank you. All right, let's get started. So the future of arthroplasty take us on SpaceX. Uh, these are my disclosures, and actually, this was actually a very challenging presentation to put together because you can imagine that our, our industry partners are not very forthcoming in sharing their innovation. So it was quite challenging. I did send out a lot of emails to try to get some information on what are some exciting pipeline products. So uh, a lot of what you're gonna see has already been mentioned a little bit uh, in the past couple of presentations. So what is innovation? It's interesting. There's a definition. It's an invention that really has a clear benefit and then gets adoption in the environment. And there are really two key, quali key qualities of a successful uh, invention or innovation. It has to be usable and it has to be desirable. And so what I'm just gonna hit upon in the next five minutes is a little bit about VR education, mixed reality, uh, patient-matched implants, and a little bit on robotics. And this is uh, some explorations that I've done. So virtual reality, uh, I think we're all very familiar with it. We mentioned it just in the last presentation. It's complete immersion into the digital environment. And we, I think we're all very familiar with this, but one of the coolest things about virtual reality is this so-called multiplayer view. So this can bring surgeons from around the world together in the VR world. So that's JP Warner, that's myself, and that's Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo. And we're all at our homes, and we've met in this virtual environment. Those are our avatars, and we're having a discussion, and we're doing an operation together. And so here we are, we're discussing how we determine version. So this is a great educational tool for residents, fellows, surgeons around the world can come into this sort of VR avatar type world. So I'm, I'm on, unhappy with how JP is doing it, so I'm gonna adjust it. Now here comes JP, you can use, see him, he's using his hand gestures like he always does. And then he's gonna go ahead and make an anatomic head and neck cut. And like when anybody takes a head cut, we're always gonna criticize it, so I push him out of the way right here. And let me take a look at that, JP. Yeah, I'll give you a B plus. And then Joaquin's like, oh, let me take a look too. So it's a very cool tool. We can use this for business meetings, we can use this for education, we can use this for teaching our fellows. So uh, I call it the Ready Player One view. Uh, so multiplayer coming soon to everywhere. Now, is VR training effective? These are two papers that we published, anywhere between 400 to 600% reduction in learning time. So this works. Pardon me. All right, so mixed reality, we heard a little bit about mixed reality already, and, and you wanted the, the feel of what you see. This is what you see. Uh, so this is me preparing for surgery. I can have my preoperative plan up there. I can cycle through it. Uh, this is just one of the positive benefits of mixed reality. The two most... I love to show the 360 colors. Pardon me? So show sure the 360 colors on your screen there. It's nice. Oh, thanks, Joe. Um, and so what are two important features of it, which I think are also game changers, is this uh, mixed reality surgical assistance. So this right here is a hologram of a person that's in another city watching me operate. And that's me there. So this digital hologram, she can watch me operate and she can animate in holograms in my field of view to either train me, uh, help me do the surgery, or you know, if I wanted Joe Boo to teach me how to use a new implant, Joe, you could be my little hologram there in your hands. I'm right here, I'm watching you yeah. virtually. So you can I'm not see, even in the room. So she's, she's actually animating in those holograms and those holograms are anchored in space. She can tell me if I'm doing well, if, she, if I want to move one screw to another place, tighten one, one screw or the other, and say if I've never used a system before uh, and I don't know what instrument to use next, she can animate in a hologram and I'll say, hey Dana, what should I use next? And she'll, hol she'll animate it in this digital hologram of the next instrument that I should use so I can pick it up. So you can imagine at 3.30 p.m. when you're switching over nurses and you have a, a, a nurse that's never done an arthroplasty, she puts on her hololens, she'll know what selection of implants and uh, products to use next. And obviously the second thing about mixed reality is gonna be the navigation. I think we have all are familiar with optical navigation, so the next step is mixed reality navigation where we have a direct onlay of the patient's anatomy on the patient. And so you can see here, and this will assist us uh, with placing our implants or executing our preoperative plans. Now what about patient-matched implants? I think uh, Zimmer Biomet released the VRS back in 2016, really has owned the market on this. So this is not new technology. Over 2,000 of these have been implanted. So this is effective technology when we're making custom implants. And you can see here, this is a, some slides and a case shared to me by my friend Jay Keener. Uh, you actually have a collaborative environment with the engineer and you come up and make uh, a surgical plan and an implant. But what about for everyday use? 
I think that's the future. The future is going to be for us to make custom-made implants, our patient-specific implants for our patients. So this patient here has a fractured spacer. Uh, I would like to do a bio-RSA, but they don't have a humeral head. They have a, a cement spacer. So I'm going to go ahead and make a patient-specific augment. So I'm just going to generate my augment. And there you go. So now in four to six weeks, this will be in my operating room. And so this is FDA approved. The unique thing about this, when we think about when we insert implants, we're always uh, preparing the bone to match our implant shape. So that's why we have all our instruments. This is the reverse. So we don't require bone prep because the implant matches the patient. So the instrumentation is minimal. There's no reaming. And essentially, you go ahead and put on your patient-specific implant. Now, the last thing, I know Joaquin already talked about this with shoulder arthroplasty. I did, did send out three emails um, uh, to companies that actually are designing um, robotic uh, shoulder arthroplasty systems, and the response I got back was pretty well uh, universal. That's in development, and there's no timeline, uh, and I am conflicted with respect to the MAKO. So uh, is this the future? Well, this is all technology that's happening now. I didn't get a chance to talk about joint sensors. I know Joaquin did, and also optical navigation, so thank you. George, I think you touched on so many things that like that's the wow and how exciting. Um, I, I want two questions. One, I'd love you to see which residents in the room actually use the, the virtual learning. Uh, so maybe you take that run. Uh, how many residents in the room are there? Raise your if hands. You raise your hands. Resident or fellow. And how many have used uh, virtual reality training? So that is what I call an opportunity. I mean, that's amazing, like, you know, 500% yeah. reduction in OR time or in, in attaining a skill. In learning skill. The interesting thing is, so 60 minutes, so there's two studies been done. They looked at specifically doing a shoulder exposure and putting in an augmented implant. Uh, 60 minutes on VR time equated to, I think, 46 minutes in the operating room. So you can train residents and fellows. So in the time of COVID, when we can maybe, when we had limited number of learners in the room, you can get, teach them a lot with VR. It's not equivalent, but it's almost. So then, George, my next question is a funny digression. I always wonder, does my preoperative plan and the preoperative or predictive range of motion, does that actually pan out to being true? The question now that I have for you on with this augmented sort of system, can I intraoperatively be told, hey, you know what, your sphere is lower than plan, or change your sphere or lateralize more to give me better range of motion? Will that happen live time? Yes, so with the HoloLens 2, it actually does visual registration. So if you have a solid object in front of you and you're wearing the HoloLens, it can actually register visually to the object. So it'll be able to tell you and record where your implants are, and so you can look at them postoperatively, and you also assess your intraoperative range of motion. As a mo I have to take over as moderator because you're taking too long. Next. <laughs> so great talk, George. Uh, George. Just one question. This visual, uh, does it really already work? And how is the precision of that? I think, to my knowledge, there are two systems available which go with this visual, visual, visual uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, the onlay, yeah, so the yeah. navigation. Uh, Carl Weiser from, uh, written a paper on this, and I think he had uh, two, degrees of, uh, two degrees off and two millimeters of accuracy. So it's actually fairly accurate. Great uh, bird's eye view of this uh, topic, uh, George. Great talk. So just, you know, your experienced surgeon, I'm sure very quick in the OR, bringing this technology into your OR, how much does it slow you down? And do you ever get back to the speed that you were before you started using this stuff? A very good question. I think when you first start, it's like anything, uh, there is a learning curve to it. Uh, eventually, you realize when you want to use it and when you don't. And I don't use it for every case. I think it's probably for my most complicated cases right now. Uh, but certainly, there is a learning curve. And I suspect as time goes on, you're going to see the value in it. It's kind of like preoperative planning. It takes time to do preoperative planning, but it's never been shown to be detrimental to prepare and plan for your cases. And those are times, that's time I'm willing to spend to have better outcomes. Bob, you got, a, you, you got like zero seconds, sorry. No problem, I guess my only, it's a follow up to that is all of these have some financial cost for us to actually bring these into our environments. And what's your recommendation to be able to um, get these, uh, these new technologies with the cost that are there uh, to, to get people to agree that it's worth the cost for us to bring them in. If that makes sense. Yeah, I was going to hey, teach. I was going to take the zero on that one. Do you remember that line? Teach, I'm taking the zero. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question, or the next part. I think, realistically, Bob, I think what you're saying is that we need good studies out there to show, demonstrate sure. value.